Step 3. Funding your business. Plenty of companies start out with a bang. It often doesn't last long. Frequently, companies will launch with a huge push, or a great viral marketing campaign that sticks them in customers' minds, but the stickiness is only so strong. Within months or a year, that initial spike of sales and attention ends. The companies that stick around are those that can comfortably handle their own growth. Earlier, we discussed Dollar Shave Club, and how it grew toward a billion dollar exit. What most people don't know about Dollar Shave Club is that it was started on a shoestring budget. Dubin sold excess razor inventory, and it was enough to develop a real customer base. And the famous, our razors are fucking great, video cost just $5,000 to produce. I bootstrapped it for the first year, and then I raised a first round of $100,000 in January 2012, Michael said. That seeded the growth that happened in 2012. Then the viral video hit in March of 2012. Dubin said he floated out of the meeting, excited to secure $100,000 in funding. It was a vote of confidence in his ability to be an entrepreneur. He invested the money into customer acquisition, which paved the way for their now famous viral video. The viral video brought in enough customers to create a steady drumbeat of new sales, which allowed the company to keep investing into growth. The viral sensation of that original video wore off, but the company had built a stream of creative media to keep them front and center in customers' attention spans. As the company grew, Dubin continued to double down on putting money into advertising to acquire new customers, rather than staying married to one way of doing things. At Dollar Shave Club, we used a combination of television, radio, display ads, and Facebook ads, and made sure that our prospective customers got a very precisely number of touches on the brand in order to convert them, he said. Still, he recommended testing small, if you're a young company, think about local media. It's a great way to get a blend of attention on a cost scale you can afford. And you'll see how different media nourish customer growth in different ways. There was one burning question that I had to know. You turned $100,000 into a billion. Were your investors happy with their return on investment? I joked. They were, he quipped. You may not raise $100,000 like Dubin, but the good news is that you don't need to, especially at the start. Michael didn't raise any money until he had proven sales. Most of the entrepreneurs I know get sales first, and then they consider outside capital. Should you go looking outside your own bank account for money, being able to show off your ability to hook new customers will be your calling card for investors. By the time you finish reading this book, getting customers will be the easy part, and keeping up with growth will be your biggest challenge. More sales does not equal more profit my first product order for sheer strength cost me $600. I ordered 100 units at $6 each and we sold it at a $32 price point. The money came out of my savings, and at the time, I was so worried that it wouldn't sell, and I'd be out $600. To the Ryan of the past, I now say two things. First, who cares? Put on your big boy pants, Ryan. It's only $600. Second, this isn't the real problem. Assuming you follow this process, create a decent product, and identify your customer, your bigger problem is that you won't be able to keep inventory in stock, as we've talked about already. Trust me on this. Keeping inventory in stock so that you can keep building your sales momentum is a real challenge. With sheer strength, we kept raising the price until it hit a point where sales were just slow enough that we could keep up with ordering the next round of inventory. We took the money we made from sales, and we bought another 500 units. Then, in the next round, we bought 1,000 units. We just kept rolling the money back in, over and over, as the company grew. It was pure bootstrapping. In retrospect, I wish we'd been even more aggressive at the beginning, but we feared what would happen if we placed that first huge order and the product didn't sell. For a lot of people, the biggest hurdle is not placing that preliminary order, but rather finding the money to avoid running out of stock faster than it can be replaced. Some entrepreneurs raise a lot of money, giving them the flexibility to make mistakes. If you're like Michael Dubin and you raise $100,000 from a group of investors, or, heck, from your rich uncle, then my hat goes off to you. Having money allows you to make mistakes, lose money, and optimize over time. It also allows you to optimize for sales instead of profits. Most entrepreneurs don't have that luxury, so they are always walking a fine line between funding the growth and optimizing their personal profits. 
That's why, at the beginning, you might have to use price as a way to control the speed of sales. If your product is selling too fast, you might have to scramble to fund your next order. If cash flow becomes a problem, then it's an indicator your price point may be too low. You may need to increase your price until sales move at a manageable level, allowing you to easily restock your product before it sells out. I get a lot of pushback against raising prices. But my competitor sells for less than me already, people say. But you are not your competitor. If you are doing the exact same thing as your competitor, then you deserve to go out of business. Focus on your customer, not your competitor. One of my mentors, Kevin Nations, has his own rule of pricing that I like. Find out what the customer wants, find out what solving their problem is worth to them, then charge them a little bit less than that. More sales are not necessarily better, especially if that means dropping your price. Most people think higher volume sales are the goal, but that's not always the case. Kia sells more cars than Cadillac, but the profit margins are higher on the latter. I've seen a lot of people play the volume game and end up getting caught dropping their prices to the point where they can barely turn a profit. That quickly results in a race to the bottom. I would much rather have moderate sales with a high profit margin and a raving fan base over high sales that can't scale. A high margin product makes it much easier to scale because you have more money to spend on advertising or rolling out second products. One of my friends, Drew Canoli, started a juice company called Organify. There were already a ton of juice powders on the market, but Drew went with a premium pricing strategy. Instead of selling for $19 to $29 as his competitors, he charged $70 for his 30 day supply. That gave him the flexibility to create an amazing product, and it gave him the profit margin to advertise it to new customers. Organify charges two or three times as much as its competitors and outsells most of them. If it had worried about competitors, it would be struggling to sell a $29 product and wondering why it couldn't generate sales, even though its product is better than its competitors. I see that happen all the time. Here's a quick marketing tip. If you listen to podcasts, you've definitely heard an ad at some point for one of the following Casper Mattress, Blue Apron, Harry's Razors, Stitch Fix, or Brooklinen. The list goes on and on. When Drew was first scaling Organify, I recommended he advertise on other people's podcasts. It gave the brand a huge surge of momentum. Podcast ads can be outrageously effective. But it's nearly impossible to afford that type of advertising if you're selling a low margin product. If you are going to pay for endorsements, influencers, or any form of advertising, you need the profit margin to be able to scale. There's just no way to afford that kind of exposure if you're selling a $29 product. Hammer down the who behind your product. One of our sheer strength products was, at one point, the second most popular on the market. This should have felt like a huge accomplishment. But the win was dulled by the fact that no matter what we did, we just could not beat out our number one competitor. I could have shouted from the rooftops that our product was better and half the price. I could have blogged about studies that proved our product had a superior ingredient profile, sourcing, and research. It wouldn't have mattered. This competitor outsold us two to one and got better reviews to boot. Why was this product outselling us two to one while being twice the price and lower quality? The difference was who, they were only targeting an older demographic with disposable income. We were targeting young guys, like us. They were targeting the segment of the market that was willing to spend more money because they were addressing a specific pain point. Our competitor's product was specifically branded for their demographic, and they crushed us. The hungriest segment of the market ignored us, we didn't look like we were, for them. People will always pay a premium to solve their specific problem. That's why we choose brands, because they are for us. This is why you absolutely must hammer down the who behind your product. If you can speak directly to your target market, you can charge twice the price while creating loyal fans. If you're just trying to sell as many products to as many people as possible, then you really can only compete on price. Roxelle is one of my favorite case studies because she focused so much on her person that she could sell anything and still be successful. If her swimsuit stopped selling, she could sell a number of other products and still have a million dollar business. Entrepreneurs get so caught up in the product that they forget about the people behind it. Roxelle did the opposite, and she can sell whatever she wants. I had Roxelle on my podcast to ask her about her story. You can listen to it at capitalism.com. Best.
If you're attempting to bootstrap your business, it's even more important to dial in your customer base. You will need that profit margin to roll into additional products. If you don't know who you're trying to target, it'll be impossible to charge the premium prices you need to build that revenue. One of my students, Roxelle Cho, is a great example of an entrepreneur who has been rewarded for knowing her customer extremely well. When she built her swimwear company, Fused Hawaii, she set out to inspire women to be more comfortable in their bodies. To do this, she came up with a very simple product, a one piece swimsuit that's both comfortable and universally flattering. She started talking about women's issues on Facebook Live, and she built a raving fan base. When it came time for her to launch her product, she pre sold her inventory before it was even in stock. When she pre sold through the first batch, she raised her price, but the orders kept coming in. She kept raising the price, but people kept buying, even though they knew that the suits wouldn't be ready for weeks. She couldn't keep her bathing suit in stock, but the money kept coming in to fund more orders. That's a fun way to fund a business. Roxelle started with a great product. But the real secret to her success was that she knew her customer extremely well. You need $10,000 in the Capitalism Conference's very first year. We had three keynote speakers Gary Vaynerchuk, he's a wonderful person, Grant Cardone, Matt, and Robert Herjavec from Shark Tank. While on stage with Robert, I asked him what the number one thing people from Shark Tank invest the money they receive from a deal in. He said, money for inventory. That surprised me, so I asked him to clarify. When it's time to go, you got to go, baby, he said. When you've got a winning product, you can't lose momentum by running out of stock. After you've bootstrapped your product and started taking sales, your focus must immediately turn to keeping stock. Sometimes that means securing money to keep enough inventory to keep building the snowball. I recommend having at least $5,000 to $10,000 ready to deploy the moment you need it. You need this money to bridge the gap that's inevitably going to happen once your product starts quickly selling out. It doesn't mean you'll have to use it, but you'll be ready if you do. If you don't have $10,000 rolling around, then you need to go out and get access to $10,000. Some first time entrepreneurs panic when they hear this, but your $10,000 doesn't have to come out of your own pocket. Your job as an entrepreneur is to get access to resources. My mentor, Travis, calls it thinking like a producer. Movie producers don't finance films with their own bank accounts. They also don't write the script or do the acting. Instead, they find the right script, hire the right actors to sell tickets, and then they raise the money to fund the film. An entrepreneur does the same thing. You have the ideas. You're not physically making the product, you have a manufacturer do that. It's your job to make the connections and manage the money. There are several ways to get the capital you need. Only one of those ways is to take it from your own bank account. Your own resources aren't your only resources, either. The money could come from a line of credit, a loan taken out against your house, or an option with an investor. It could be money from Kickstarter or Cabbage.com or Amazon Lending. The money could come from anywhere, really, it's just up to you to go find it. Here's an inventory tip one benefit to placing a huge order is you have some wiggle room to negotiate with your suppliers. When you're only ordering 100 units at a time, you're going to pay the retail rate. But the more you order, the more negotiating power you have. Sometimes, a bigger order knocks down your per unit price by up to 30 to 50%. It's a huge boon to the long term growth of your business to be able to make a large order that drives down the COGS, cost of goods sold. If you decide to raise capital, the fastest way to raise capital is to bring on an outside investor. If that investor is willing to be an advisor or a strategic contact, it can be a huge benefit to your growth. And contrary to popular belief, outside investors are usually open to investing in new ideas. Yet nearly every day, I see well intentioned entrepreneurs botch their pitches to potential investors. You just tell them about your business and ask for $10,000 for inventory, right? No, it's important to remember that investors aren't interested in your ideas but their return on investment. There has to be a clear plan for success in order for that money to go to work. As a potential investor, I'm looking at your business plan. Specifically, I want to know how that money will be spent to make the business grow faster. Most importantly, who is your potential audience, and where are they? How are you getting in front of them? What are your plans for follow up products? How are you allocating the money, and how are you planning to reach potential customers? 
A lot of people are just looking for a band aid. They'll approach an investor with the following pitch I'm out of cash. I need an infusion or I'm out of business. Can you solve my problem? No investor ever said, Shut up and take my money. Raising money on an idea is really hard and stupid. Raising money to fix a problem is even harder. Raising money to amplify what's already working. That's a slam dunk. From an investor's standpoint, I want to see how my money is going to grow the brand. The purpose of money is to make things go faster. It's great that you've got a strong product that's selling well, but do you have two or three other product ideas you can roll out to the same customer? Because 10 grand might help you bridge this one gap, but it's not going to provide a return if you don't have a solid idea for your brand and more ideas that you can sell. Remember that in the long run, a product does not create a million dollar business, but a brand does. Ask yourself the question is this investment going to grow a company, or are we looking to just patch a fulfillment problem? The former excites me, and the latter just makes me feel used. For example, someone approached me at one of my conferences and pitched me on investing in a feminine hygiene product. As little as I know about feminine hygiene, it did solve a major pain point. And the total market potential was in the hundreds of millions. So I looked at him and said, Okay, so what has stopped you from rolling this out? I don't have money to get it started, he said. I passed. No one wants to fund an idea with no momentum. If you aren't willing to do the work to even develop a prototype, then you haven't shown any initiative that money is going to be well spent. I once heard it said that money is attracted to movement. Show movement, and the money will follow. Your investors want to see that their money is going to be put to wise use. That means showing them what products you're going to roll out, how the money will be used to acquire new customers, and what momentum is already being built. And, to be totally transparent, The opportunity at your fingertips if you do this right is huge. There is always more money than there are good ideas. Investors will literally buy up crappy companies because there aren't enough good, let alone great companies for sale. At the same time, there are an abundance of businesses that were never able to cross certain monetary hurdles and so are sitting on the market endlessly, never getting sold. Most buyers will not look at a business priced under a million dollars. And they won't look at a business that doesn't have revenue of at least a million dollars, which is why the 12 months to $1 million process is so important. Pro tip when pitching to an investor, do not ask them for money. Ask for advice. Tell the investor you've been pursuing an opportunity and explain the momentum that you have. Tell them that you've run into funding challenges. Tell them that you want to place larger inventory orders to serve your growing audience. Then tell them how much money you think you need. Finally, ask them, how would you fund the growth of this business if you were me? Asking for money puts people on the defensive. Asking for advice opens them up. Watch how fast money shows up. Crowdfunding if you don't want to take on an investor, crowdfunding with a site like Kickstarter is another option. I have a student, Sophie, who wanted to start a business aligned with her mission to reduce waste in the world. She created a reusable lunchbox and started off selling it on Amazon. It was a modest success, but being able to place big enough orders to keep inventory in stock was putting a huge strain on her cash flow. She needed capital to scale up production. It wasn't that Sophie couldn't have found investors, I, for one, would have been happy to invest in her company. But when she weighed the cost of taking money from an investor and giving up a chunk of her company versus keeping control, she decided to raise money via Kickstarter instead. The benefit of crowdfunding on Kickstarter goes beyond raising money. You're effectively creating exposure and superfans, a horde of customers who are literally invested in the success of your business. Furthermore, you're not just getting money, you're recruiting customers as well. Here are a few must haves for running a successful Kickstarter campaign that puts you on the map and gets you the capital you need 1. You need a great video. The most important element is that the video communicates a specific emotion. Sophie's video was recorded on her iPhone, but it was purpose driven and rooted in emotion. At the very least, you need a video that explains what you're doing, why, and where you're going next. Note that you don't need professional equipment to put a good video together. Plenty of people create compelling videos using only their smartphones. There are tons of tutorials out there on how to do this. Educate yourself on YouTube, too. You need a list of at least 10 ideal customers in your network, friends, co workers, etc., who are excited about what you're doing. Ask them to share your Kickstarter with their networks, 
which means their friends, their church groups, their fans, and especially their social media followers. This will be just enough exposure to get the ball rolling. Sophie didn't have a huge audience, she simply shared her video on her personal Facebook page and asked her friends to do the same. That was enough to get things moving. 3. You need at least one micro influencer who can help spread the video's message. It's time to go out and knock on doors to find that influencer. These could be Facebook groups, Instagrammers, bloggers, YouTubers, or podcasters. The only requirement is that this influencer has at least 10,000 eyeballs on their page or account. 10,000 really is the magic number. At that level, the influencer isn't so big that they will ignore you, but they are big enough that their influence helps spread the word. Sophie didn't know any influencers, so she contacted the leader of an eco-friendly Facebook group that had 20,000 members. She asked if she could talk about her Kickstarter in the group, and they agreed. That community ravenously shared and supported Sophie's Kickstarter campaign. Just like any business, people want to know what's different about what you're offering. As with any marketing venture, it's your job to work like hell to get your information in front of the right people. Make a hit list of people you need to connect with to raise awareness about this launch. Sophie ended up raising more than $25,000 in pre-orders for the product. She was expecting more like $5,000, so she really had to hustle to fulfill those orders. Luckily, with Kickstarter you have a bit more time for fulfillment than you do on Amazon, so she was able to deliver. One of the most helpful trainings for using Kickstarter is available for free on Tim Ferriss's blog. Tim documents a campaign, along with examples and specific wording to smash all goals, on this post, www.tim. Blog, Kickstarter. She used that capital and that momentum to roll out product after product, and she used the exposure from the Kickstarter campaign to get more press in her local area and online. A few years later, Sophie's business was nearing $10 million in sales. Not bad for an idea that started with a $5,000 goal. Good debt and bad debt if you don't like the idea of giving up a piece of your company and crowdfunding sounds too labor-intensive, taking out a loan to get you over the bridge is your other option. People are generally averse to the idea of taking out loans, but you can't consider debt in a vacuum. There's good debt and bad debt. The way you calculate if debt is good or bad is how it's used. Good debt produces return on investment, ROI, and bad debt is merely money spent. Borrowing money to buy a fancy car is a bad use of debt. The car loses value as soon as you drive it off the lot, so the ROI is negative. Your money is no longer working for you, it's just gone. But, if you're using debt to buy something with a higher rate of return, that's good debt. That debt will ultimately make you money. For example, if you take out a loan to buy a house, and you rent the house out at a profit, then that's a good use debt. Bank loans are your best bet for affordable debt, and the Small Business Administration is one of the best sources of low-cost debt in the world. Its drawback? Time. Getting approved can take months. One potential source of good debt is Cabbage.com which offers crowdfunded loans for businesses. It's best used carefully, however, because it has really high interest rates, often, somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. Why would you use a service that's so expensive? Because it's still less expensive than running out of inventory. If you're going to borrow money at 20 percent because you're going to use that money to buy inventory at $10 and sell it for $50, then you've now traded a 20 percent interest rate for a 500 percent return. Most of the time that's a pretty good trade. I use strategic debt in my business when I can reliably predict my ROI. If I know I'm going to sell my inventory and get a 200% ROI on that purchase, then it makes sense to pay 10% or more on a loan. That frees up a lot of cash to use in other areas of business. If you sell on Amazon or use Shopify for your online store, these services often release funding options for businesses with at least 6 to 12 months of sales history. Amazon's program is, predictably called Amazon Lending, and it's one of the best sources of debt because it's affordable and fast. However, you must be consistently selling on Amazon before this option becomes available to you. One caveat to debt while there is nothing inherently wrong with debt, I would caution anyone against using debt at the very beginning of an idea. Taking out loans for an unproven concept is a fast route to financial disaster. Damon John, the CEO of FUBU and a regular investor on Shark Tank, spoke on stage at the Capitalism Conference. He explained how debt can cripple a business. 
If you take out $100,000 for a business, it's easy to get distracted by storefronts and packaging without ever taking sales. Wait until you have predictable sales to take out debt. One of my most famous YouTube videos is about how to use debt to create passive income. It's a video about leveraging what I call ROI arbitrage. It's borrowing against your house, for example, to buy a website that's producing 25% per year in passive income. Borrowing 5% to make 25% is a good leveraging of debt. Borrowing money to spend it or borrowing money to make speculative investments is bad debt. For example, buying into cryptocurrency is a kind of speculation. People would say they were investing in cryptocurrencies. No, they were speculating on the price going up and down. That's gambling. When you have a product that's not yet proven to be marketable to customers, you're speculating. You're guessing. This is a bad time to borrow against your home or take out a business loan. I don't recommend going into debt to start a new business. Use debt to sustain and grow your business, knowing that the payments will come out of future sales. One of my students and business associates has an investment banking background, and he saw the challenge that new entrepreneurs have when funding their inventory. He rounded up some of his investment banking buddies and started a company designed to get entrepreneurs the capital that they need to get past the inventory hump. They specialize in getting sellers affordable capital fast, without causing stress for the entrepreneur. I love it when an entrepreneur sees a problem and creates a win-win solution, that's capitalism in action. You can find funding options like this at capitalism.com, funding. Once you have predictable sales, then you know there's an ROI to your business. Now you can invest more into it. That's when it's a good idea to raise money, go all in, or borrow to be able to scale the business. But not until that point. There's a chasm of difference between the two. Another thing to note is that debt should always go into scaling inventory, not advertising or other costs. Debt has to be paid back, so use it on predictable expenses. You're not guaranteed an ROI on advertising, but if your inventory is guaranteed to sell, then you can be confident that you'll be able to settle up the debt it took to buy that inventory. How to know if you need money Money is an amplifier, not a magic wand. If you have a bad idea, money just amplifies that bad idea. If it's a good idea, it can spread that idea to new customers. So how do you know the difference? My first question for you, have you proven that you can predictably turn $10,000 into at least $20,000? Show me the sales numbers from rolling out your first round of inventory. Money needs to have a strategic reason, and it needs to provide an ROI. How will the use of that money result in a more profitable, more successful business? My second question, how are you taking your sales? If you have a built-in audience, from an influencer or a social media following, you might be able to pre-sell all $10,000 worth of product via Kickstarter or as a private sale. Take pre-orders and use that money to purchase your stock, and then pass the bill directly to your customers. If you're having trouble keeping up with demand, or if you want to go bigger and have a reasonable plan to invest more money, then you can present your opportunity to an investor. While you're shopping for a good investor, you can fund the business with small microloans from companies such as Cabbage.com and Upfund. If you don't know what route to go, don't go into debt. Raise your price. Focus on higher profits rather than acquiring funding. When in doubt, wait. Make a list of investors who you might want to work with, and tell them what you're up to. Then, take the time to allow the opportunity to present itself. Maybe you meet an influencer along the way, and you know that it will cause inventory constraints. Perhaps you get picked up by a major news outlet, and it puts a strain on inventory. That's when you make the call to your investor list. Above all, focus on sales and proving your product. Most people are waiting for money so they can make a move. In reality, they have it backward, money follows movement. Funding your business isn't a matter of getting the money to push your product but a matter of creating enough momentum to attract the money you need. However, if you follow the steps in the next chapters, that momentum will snowball very quickly. Entrepreneur Spotlight, AJ Patel back in 2013, AJ was looking for a new opportunity. For 10 years he'd tried his hand at an array of businesses, with ups and downs, some success, and a lot of failures. In high school he had a web hosting business that made $5,000 a month. Then in college, he made six figures doing internet marketing. But both those businesses fell away. By 2013, he was ready for something new. He wanted to try his hand at selling a physical product. 
AJ looked for something based in the United States that he could really get behind. Having had issues with his skin ever since he was young, he started a line of skincare products. There was a lot of demand, and he could relate to the customer. He started by learning how to make sales on Amazon with Argan Oil, a natural skin and hair care product. Two weeks after launch, he was making $1,000 a day. He knew this was it. People were actually buying what he was selling. He decided to add fuel to the fire. He started a second product and went all in with $40,000 of credit card and personal loan debt to bolster the business. I said earlier that I'm debt averse, but this is an example of a time when debt worked very, very well for an entrepreneur. AJ's gamble paid out big. After about three months, he was making more than $100,000 a month and was on track for a million dollar year. And just 13 months after his first Argan oil sale, he'd blown far beyond that million dollar a year mark. He was making seven figures every single month. AJ's path wasn't without its stumbles. In that first year, he tried to do everything in the business, which was a real learning experience. He finally realized going it alone just wasn't scalable. He needed help. He began hiring, discovering that to be successful, you need a really good team that's collectively smarter than you alone. Basically, he told me, you need a team that will mask your weaknesses. As the business grew, he built his team faster, became quicker at delegating work, and learned to be a better leader. He focused on scalable infrastructure, thinking about the resources he'd need in six months or a year, so he could get ahead in hiring the right people. After a couple of years, AJ had close to 20 products in his brand. Every new item built on what he knew his consumers wanted a wider selection of natural skincare products. He added deodorants, moisturizers, and toners, and paid attention to see how the market reacted. As his business matured, so did his process of adding new products. Instead of guessing what his consumers wanted and then measuring sales, he proactively aligned his product selection with his brand values. He looked closely at his product portfolio and tweaked it, cleaning up the product ingredient list. Making everything really natural and refreshing the branding. These days, anything you build has to have a strong brand component, he said. I don't think that was necessarily true when I started back in 2013. These days, you have to go beyond just a product based business. You have to focus on your why. With the success of his brand and the support of his team, AJ was able to start four more businesses in as many years. One was Trinova. A brand selling home, auto, and boat products, which he sold at the end of 2016 for a very impressive dollar amount. But even before he sold Trinova, he launched a pet supplements brand, and then added health and wellness supplements to his portfolio. These brands were successful enough to get interest from a private equity firm. He divested a portion to private equity while keeping a good chunk of ownership and staying on the board of directors, so he can help however possible. Most recently, he launched a brand called Smooth Viking, which sells men's beard and hair care products. He also started his own private equity company to invest in other businesses. All this started by selling his first product on Amazon. People are always afraid of failing, but failures can provide really valuable insights and lessons, which give you more confidence, AJ said. Most people don't take action because they're afraid of losing money or of what someone might say about them. But when you take action, you'll at least learn something, even if you don't make money. Every year, AJ learns more than he did the year before. More than anything, he's learned that success really comes down to people. People help you scale businesses, and that's what allowed him to run five different brands at the same time, and to ensure those brands align with his reason for being.